This is Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. SV Date has worked in the media for a long time. Some people today get their information on paper, some get it on TV, increasingly many get it on their phones or on social media. But all of that matters because of what people do with that information, how it influences their thinking, their decisions, their votes, and the direction of our society. SV has seen all of this evolve over time, including what's happened as more and more people have gotten their news from different types of sources, where the incentives and relationship with facts are very different than in actual news or journalism. This is an edited version of a longer conversation that was taped live, just like all of our episodes. If you want to join us, ask an upcoming guest a question, or hear past episodes, please visit our website, pm101.live. We bring you voices from across the political spectrum. Our next episode this Monday will feature Barbara McQuaid, a former prosecutor who has studied and participated in the judicial system for decades and who has a very unique perspective on this moment in history. Please take a second and subscribe on whichever streaming service you're using right now to make sure you don't miss it. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. We were watching you ask the president if he regrets lying to the American public over the last three and a half years. And Trump's response was just absolutely hilarious. Before we get going, what prompted you to ask that question? It's the one question he'd never been asked. And it's the one question that really mattered at that point, right? I mean, uh, the news of the day, if I remember right, that day was like, payroll taxes. And were they going to cut payroll taxes to boost the economy? And let's be honest, uh, Donald Trump doesn't know a lot that much about payroll taxes. He, and he changed his answer every single day for like a week. What does it matter what he thinks today? He's just going to change it again tomorrow. And so when, uh, when he called on me, and I was rather surprised that he did, um, he had avoided my questions on Air Force One like the previous week when I was traveling, he saw me and like left immediately. But I was wearing a different colored mask. So I think maybe that confused him. And so then he called on me and I, I asked the one thing that I've been wanting to ask for, for years at that point. Was that your first chance to actually ask him a direct question or had you asked him a few other things before and realized that this was uh, maybe a better line of questioning? I've I'd had very few opportunities to ask him. I mean, in, in gaggles, occasionally I'd shouted out questions. He'd uh, given me mean looks, but ignored them. Uh, I, I had tried to ask that same question earlier on in the pandemic in the context of now that we're in a crisis, are you going to you know, be straight with the American people? And I, and I made the mistake of prefacing at that time with there's a new poll that shows uh, your credibility is, is very low among the public. And as soon as I said the word poll, you know, he was like, oh, what poll was that? You know, my poll showed that I'm the most popular and it was off to the races and I never got another word in. So I knew that should I get the opportunity again, you need to go with the question immediately. No preface, just ask and let's see what happens. I suppose if you've hired John McLaughlin as your pollster, all of your polls are excellent. <laughs> they, yeah, he's, they're 100 percent. He's more than 100 percent in some polls in terms of his uh, popularity. That's the pollster that Eric Cantor used, right? Yeah, yeah was, that's, ex- that's exactly yeah. right. I, was it 70% off of the final <laughs> results? No, he was going to cruise to a primary win, no problem, don't worry about it. You know, just go about your business. And, and I think the RNC had put out a briefing to, to all the campaigns saying, do not hire this man. They tried to blacklist him, but when you have a client whose only requirement is you tell him what he wants to hear, then he's actually a perfect candidate for the job. Right. And, you know, in, in, in Cantor's defense, most members of Congress particularly those close to leadership or in leadership, it, no one thinks about primarying them. And so that when he got a primary challenge, it was seen as, you know, this is ridiculous. Why are we bothering? Um, and, you know, that should have been probably the first clue that, that what we saw in 2015 and 2016 in the presidential race was uh, not an anomaly. That was coming. SV, you've been writing stories about Trump since he's left office, you've been covering him. Obviously, when he was in the White House, you had that question that we just referenced, asking him how he felt about lying to the American public for three and a half years. How has the Trump beat and just 
covering anything out of Trump world changed since he's left office. And I'm specifically wondering the pace of news, because it was almost nonstop breakneck when he was in office. Is that a major difference when you're looking towards Trump world? Oh, of course. And it, 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 the, it, the big part of that was he was the president of the United States at the time, right? So even the most inane thing he might tweet about um, mattered. And, and it, it, maybe it mattered a lot, depending on how other people reacted to it or other countries reacted to it. And so now, you know, I, I will get five, six, seven statements from the 45th president of the United States, uh, Save America, or from the office of the 45th president. And I'll ignore 95 percent of them because they're, um, you know, they're not important. And I don't have to cover everything he does anymore. He's not the president. And I've got other things to do. And I've got uh, enterprise reporting to do. I've got campaign finance reports to, to look through. I've got the Biden White House to pay attention to. In the White House press corps, when Trump was in office, especially, there were these journalists that were stenographers uh, printing White House spin to protect sources. And then today that's morphed into some of these people that we don't need to name names, but just retweeting these press statements that you just said they're not really news. You have other news to cover. When you see these stenographers, how do you look on them? Is that really news or are they doing a disservice to the profession? You know, it, it, I, I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, most of the folks you're talking about, uh, I believe, are, are, are pretty young. I mean, they're, uh, they don't have a whole lot of experience, you know, under their belts there. And sometimes their assignment is literally to cover Trump. That's it. That's what they do. They go to every rally. They they at least notice every single statement that the that the man puts out. That's their job. And I get that. I mean, I used to work for the Associated Press, and uh, it was a different time. Social media didn't exist, but my job was sometimes just to be a stenographer. That's what we did. I covered this committee hearing. Here's what happened in it. Here was the vote. Two hundred words. Done. Move on. And so I get that part of journalism. On the other hand. This guy's not just some random person. He tried to overthrow the republic. And that ought to be the context, I think, that everybody includes uh, in, in coverage about him. Otherwise, you're failing your audience because most people are not plugged in. They're not paying attention to the news all the time. And so if, if you don't put that in there, the casual news consumer who's, who has a life to lead, um, it's going to say, oh, well, I guess January 6th, that thing that happened must not have been a big deal. After all, everyone's treating him like a normal person again. Uh, and that's a failure. I mean, he's not a normal. We've had 232 years of elections. Only one guy tried to end the republic because he lost, right? And that ought to be relevant in every single story that we have about him. What about the older journalists that are nationally acclaimed, have millions of Twitter followers, and aren't these young journalists where it's their job to do this? It, it seems to me from the outside, you're, again, you've been in the room in the White House, but it seems to me that a lot of this is done just to keep a good relationship with their sources. They print something today that maybe puts the sources into a favorable light, and then tomorrow maybe they get some breaking news is that just normal journalism or are these people taking it a step further and amplifying things, uh, an insurrectionist especially, that shouldn't be amplified? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And, and again, it goes to uh, none of this is normal, right? And, and that model of, of dealing with politicians has been the norm for a while. Me personally, I never, I never did that. I mean, I I, I came of age in Florida where the public records law were so good and people had to be, by law, so responsive that my attitude was, all right, don't talk to me. I'm going to get what I need using the what we call the uh, statute 119, and I'm going to get it within a day or two, and I'm going to do the story. So either you'll get your side in it or you won't. Either way, I'm publishing. And that worked for me. It obviously doesn't work at the national level, especially the White House, which is not subject to FOIA. Um, and, you know, I get it. I mean, some of these uh, uh, publications have multiple reporters covering the same person and they can have a good cop, bad cop sort of routine with this. You know, one person will write the, all the negative stories and someone else will try to keep access, uh, you know, and, and, and play the good cop. 
<laughs> back when I was at the Palm Beach Post, uh, my my bureau mate and I, our, our editor would tell us that you guys are not good cop, bad cop, you're bad cop, worse cop. And, you know, that was meant as a compliment. And uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I, I don't know that they have to give anything in order to get Trump's people to talk to them, because what are they going to do? He's banned from Twitter. He's not on Facebook. I mean, you know, he needs us. And so we can be discerning, I think, about what we choose to amplify and what we don't. And when there's real news, we should treat it as such. And when it's nonsense, we should ignore it. The United States lost 60,000 factories after China entered the WTO. To confront these unfair practices, I placed massive tariffs. As I have made very clear, I will not accept a bad deal for the American people. China is not in compliance with the phase one trade deal that was signed in January 2020. Under that deal, China had two years to buy uh, $200 billion in additional U.S. goods over the course of each of those years. And China's purchases have fallen well below that target. I think, Mr. Date, that the last thing you said, it taps into something that I think is a big flaw in the way that the press have covered Trump over the last six years or more, which is that they often seem to be quite reactionary to the outrage of the day. Whatever the big tweet or misstatement or offensive comment of the day is the thing that's being amplified and responded to and reacted to. And, you know, to the credit of many pundits, of course, they're being very critical they're coming from the right place. But don't you think that when we're this reactionary on a daily basis, we're losing track of these bigger themes and maybe the elements of public policy that have more impact on people that matter more? Just yesterday, the uh, PIIE, the Peterson Institute for yes. Economics, they published a report that shows that China have not held any of the commitments of the phase one trade deal that was negotiated by the Trump team. The $200 million in extra purchases that they were supposed to make None of them have been made. And so this was one of the crowning policies that the Trump people ran on. And while the opposition and m much of the press was focused on the daily outrages, this was being touted as a big policy success because no one was actually reporting on what was really happening from a policy perspective. And I think a lot of the people in the press corps during the, the Trump years are responsible for that. Don't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, you know, and I touched a, about on this a little bit in, in, uh, in my book that I wrote about Trump, uh, The Useful Idiot. And it's so much has changed in journalism over the last 20 years. And a big reason was the recession of 2009, uh, the, the financial crisis and the destruction in local journalism. It used to be that if you got to be a White House correspondent, if you were in that briefing room, that meant that you'd come up through a regional paper, a local paper, You'd covered school boards. You'd covered city commission. You probably covered police. You just had a lot of experience with the world before you came and covered state government and then maybe Congress and then finally the White House. That doesn't happen anymore. You have you have very young reporters in their early to mid 20s who this may be their very first job and they're working at a at a, at a website, typically one that is, you know, not NBC's website or, or you know, some uh, mainstream outfit. This is, um, you know, like, example, Daily Caller uh, or, uh, I don't know, Talking Points Memo on the, on the progressive side. And suddenly they're covering the White House. And, and it, you know, you ought to know stuff about the planet before you're in that job. And that's not happening anymore. And it's not their fault. Now, the, as to your question, are we too reactive? We absolutely are. And we absolutely were in 2015. I remember, you know, we all remember CNN would just have, you know, have a shot of the empty stage where Trump is going to speak in a half hour, an hour, whatever. And I'll tell you why that was, because it's 2015. Normal human beings are not paying attention to the presidential race, right? This guy's great for ratings. He says crazy stuff. And so... Uh, you know, sure, we'll give him an hour, hour and a half, whatever, whatever he does. And meanwhile, Jeb Bush would be going on his seven point plan about um, 
uh, education uh, reforms. And Marco Rubio, we tell the story of his uh, growing up and, and uh, his dad being a bartender and a, and a janitor or whatever. And meanwhile, Trump is insulting everyone. Well, which, is, which one of those is going to be more entertaining? Obviously, Trump. The disservice was, you know, we were not pointing out in real time enough of us, often enough, that it was nonsense. You, you know, you talk about the, the trade policy. He was talking about doing tariffs, you know, back in 2015. And I don't remember reading very many stories about how this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard about it, it, what he's saying makes no sense. He doesn't understand the WTO. He doesn't understand NAFTA. He doesn't understand any of this. Did you ever see that story get prominent play in the New York Times, Washington Post? I don't remember that. Maybe it did at the bottom of the page or inside or something because he was never taken seriously. You know, there's, there's plenty of blame to go around. And, and I hoped we would learn our lessons from 2015, 2016. And I'm not convinced that we have. You've outlined how this is a temptation. There's sometimes a commercial imperative. Sometimes, you know, the readership are demanding the more outrage based reactionary type reporting. Is it something that you think that you often fell for, uh, a temptation or an instinct that uh, that you think that sometimes was too tempting uh, during your own coverage of those years? You know, th- there were a few times I remember that he said something outrageous and I wrote a story about it. I tried not to. I mean, I usually tried to go to these things with uh, with an idea of the, of the theme I was going to write about and then do the reporting to... to uh, flush that out. I remember one in during one speech, he talked about how we're not going to let Hillary Clinton nominate people to the Supreme Court. You know, Second Amendment people, we, we've got that. And it struck me, is this guy just threatening murder of his, of his opponent? What, what does he mean, the Second Amendment people? And so that, and, but I, in, in that sense, I thought that was a legitimate question that... It, uh, he, he'd already been prone to to use you know uh, uh, vile, uh, imagery of violence in his in his um, in his rallies, and I thought that one crossed the line, and, and so I you know made a big deal out of it. Um, it, it I, I, I do know this is not so much for me because I've been in this business for a long time, but there are younger reporters who are absolutely going to either have their jobs in six months or not based on the number of clicks they deliver. That's that's bad. And that's one thing we've lost by quantifying all of this is that we've realized just how few people care about news that we used to think was important. And, you know, customers always right. And the customer does not want uh, the school board meeting. Customers not going to get it. And that's, I think, part of what's driving all of this. You basically just said our system is broken because of profit incentives. Just look at Jeff Zucker, who was the person who made Trump in a lot of ways. He found him at NBC with The Apprentice, and then he was the one at CNN that really mainstreamed Trump with all of these different uh, televising these rallies, like you said, in 2015, to give the public the sugar high, the entertainer, the ringling brother. And then he also was in communication with Michael Michael Cohen, uh, telling him after the campaign fails, there'll be a spot for him at CNN. And when he was fired, you had almost a revolt in the newsroom by their even their quote unquote hard news people because their cash cow had had left the farm. But I wanted to get into the difference in how the press corps covers this White House versus the previous White House. And more specifically, is there the same energy in the press corps to do the investigative journalism to try and uncover what's going on? Because the Afghanistan debacle was a major, major crisis and a major failure. And I just haven't seen that same fervor of investigative journalism into the Biden administration. I would say it's useful to look at it from a slightly different framework. And that is, how have all presidencies been covered except for Donald Trump's, and look at it that way. And, and, and I would say that this presidency is being covered much like the Obama presidency was covered, much like the George uh, W. Bush presidency was covered, the George Herbert Walker Bush presidency. The Clinton. In, in other words, mainly what we write about now are somewhat boring government policies and whether they're working or not. Afghanistan was uh, an anomaly. I mean, that was a very different situation and, uh, and there was a lot of critical coverage. I wrote a story back in, in August 
saying that, you know, if, if the man wanted to continue with the withdrawal uh, as early as he did, he should have started planning on January 21 for this and not in, 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 in April. And I wasn't the only one writing that. There, there was a lot, it was a fair amount of that coverage. So, you know, is there a double standard? I, I, I sort of got that sense. I don't think so, because with the Trump administration, you really did. It was it was like not even apples and oranges. It was apples and uh, moon rocks. I mean, it was it was so different and just nothing like we'd ever seen. We basically had. Look, I, I remember this in the first week. Sebastian Gorka was walking around the White House with a blue badge. OK, I mean, that's how ridiculous it was. Um, that was like a, a, a crisis for four years that everyone was kind of dealing with. And that's why I think uh, it, it was very, very different from from what you see now. I'd slightly push back and say that we are in a new world with social media and we don't really have all of these large institutions with these massive investigative journalism uh, outlets. So I, I think that it might be difficult to compare uh, the coverage of George W. Bush to President Biden. There has been a massive drop off in media consumption. And has that drop off in media consumption changed the way that news bureaus go about covering this White House or has it not? I, I, I don't think it has. And I, and I think, again, um, the, the news people who've been around for a bit and and uh, and looking at audiences, they're, they're probably comparing this to what it was pre-Trump. I mean, how how is uh, how are White House stories doing now in terms of readership than they c- compared to what they were uh, in the second term of Obama, in the second term of uh, of, of uh, George W. Bush, you know, leaving aside 9-11 and, and its aftermath. Uh, I, uh, as an example, what I'm talking about, a typical influence peddling conflict of interest story is a relative of the president will get a job as a lobbyist um, for a lot of money. Is this a conflict? Is he taking advantage of the position, et cetera? Compare that to what we had, you know, uh, two years ago when the president of the United States was accepting cash money from lobbyists, foreign and domestic, at a hotel five blocks away from the White House. I mean, nothing compared to, to that in terms of just straight up open corruption. It was worse than Teapot Dome. I mean, that didn't involve the actual president at the time. So you know, I, we're back to the normal kind of, isn't this a conflict that, uh, that James Biden is doing this or in his, uh, and his daughter-in-law got this? And yeah, I'm glad we're doing those stories. I'm glad we're doing stories about uh, donors who are getting appointed to ambassadorships. That's the standard kind of Washington conflict of interest, um, money talks kind of thing. And in a way, that's good. That's healing. That's the level of corruption you know, a major industrialized country ought to be worried about, not is the president on the take personally, which is what we literally had uh, just a couple of years ago. And uh, another example of that kind of garden variety Washington, D.C. corruption is this issue of members of Congress trading stocks, which, thanks to some great reporting, has led to a public pressure campaign, which is now leading to actual, likely, legislative change. Right, right, uh, absolutely. Has, but, um, Mr. Date, in regard to your point about this sort of unique corruption of the previous administration and the people around it, uh, one of your recent pieces is rather illustrative of this, this connection that you've been able to draw between uh, a gentleman who was actually on the RNC payroll, uh, who was one of the names listed uh, in a fraudulent slate of electors that was sent uh, to Washington as representing, I believe, uh, which state was it? Was it the it was state Georgia? Of Georgia, yeah. That's yeah. I I, I'm the family member of an AUSA. He used to prosecute wire fraud and mail fraud, and I'm looking at the story, the <laughs> false the slate of electors, and to me, it looks like pretty clear cut case of mail fraud. And you've drawn a pretty close connection between the RNC, the political apparatus of one of the two major American parties, and something that's so blatantly fraudulent. Uh, how close do you think? that the big decision makers in the Trump campaign, in Trump's inner circle at the RNC were to the most extraordinary and sleaziest parts of the effort to overturn the election. 
I would draw a bright line between the RNC and the Trump campaign in the White House, right? Because the RNC lawyers um, were actual lawyers and they understood that bad things happen if you cross this line. And so I would, I would remove them. But what I still can't get is that at the time, between November 4th and, and, uh, and January 6th, there's this heady rush of everyone just kind of saying, yeah, rah, rah, Trump, we're for him. Whatever he wants, we're on board. And so they signed pieces of paper claiming to be something that was obviously not true, sent it to the United States government, and then sent it via the mail, right? I mean, what the hell were they thinking? What is that? What, what, would you do that with your tax return? I have 18 children. Give me you know, $75,000, you, you know, the child tax credit. Try that out and see how that works. Send it through the mail. Go for it. This is madness. I don't understand how uh, so many people bought into this idea that this is just totally fine. It's part of politics. And, uh, and in fairness, not all of them did. The electors, the Trump electors in Pennsylvania and New Mexico said, whoa, 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 no, we're not signing that. We will add in language that if somehow we end up being the electors because of a court order, et cetera, then, you know, we vote for Trump and Pence. But the other 59, man, did they not talk to a lawyer at all? What were they thinking? So as far as we know, then, this gentleman who appears to have committed belated mail fraud, federal crime, uh, it, it's almost a coincidence, his relationship with the RNC. We can't yet draw a, a closer connection between the decision makers and the decision that he made in this situation. I think that Rona McDaniel's personal reasons for getting behind this thing, because she could have squashed it like a bug. She could have said, no, we're not doing this. We're not going to go after um, Cheney and Kinzinger. We're just not going to do that. But she wanted to. And it was because her friend from Michigan was getting hassled by the committee because she was one of these 59 electors. And so she, I think, in my view, personal opinion, she made a, a dumb decision that, she, that she's going to allow this to go forward. As to whether there was a financial, necessarily financial interest, I don't think so. I think they just wanted to say, we're sticking up for our own. We're sticking up for our RNC members. We're sticking up for our uh, RNC lawyers. We're sticking up for staff who might be pulled into this. Um, it, it's just tribalism, I think, more than corruption. But, but still, I mean, it, it, it's, again, I, I don't think these people have taken seriously yet what exactly this means that uh, the Department of Justice could charge them all with fraud, mail fraud, forgery, making false. I mean, you, I mean there, there, there's, a, there's a long list of stuff that they could be charged with. And, and then the most serious of these are the easiest ones to prove. They dropped it in the mail, right? Because the instructions were to send it by certified mail up to the National Archives. That's 20 years is a, is a maximum sentence here. So anyway. Not exactly criminal masterminds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they even viewed it as a possible crime at the time, which baffles me, just absolutely baffles me. You're sending this to the U.S. Archive, the National Archives, that you're an elector in a state that your guy didn't win? I mean, what? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and when I was at the RNC, just to show you how it's changed, the, R the Hollywood access tape broke and they – literally sat down with Trump trying to push him out of the race. And and now it's whitewashing January 6th, calling it legitimate political discourse. So, I mean, these people, uh, they have no shame if they're working at the RNC. From That's my perspective. I think we're going to go next to the audience. And we are going to go first to Marshall. Do you think that the, the, the stark difference between the two presidents has made folks in the media take a breath, go, it's okay, and, and maybe not be as intense about it as they should because they feel like we've come back from the brink in a big way? Um, that, that's an excellent question. I would say actually the opposite. I think that Biden is getting more grief from the media in his first year than I think a, a, a president ordinarily would in the first year. And I think part of it is because people are looking at, you know, we really wrote a lot of tough stuff about Donald Trump. We should really be just as hard on, on Joe Biden, except, you know, if, you, if you've covered a, a bank robber and now you've covered a shoplifter, it's not doesn't make sense to be as tough on one as the other because they're, they're different levels here. 
I mean, as an example, everyone is giving Biden grief for why didn't you get more people vaccinated? Well, what was he supposed to do other than go to people's unvaccinated people's houses and, and literally you know, stick them in the arm with with the syringes himself? I mean, people didn't want it. I don't know how many speeches I've sat through of it, urging people to get vaccinated, to get in, getting other people to give speeches to get vaccinated. So in, in other words, I, I think he's getting almost the Trump standard of coverage in terms of we need to be tough with him when he's not Trump. He's this guy who probably wouldn't have been president if uh, if 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 Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or any of those others in 2016 had been the Republican president instead. In fact, they probably would have won re-election easily because they wouldn't have messed up the pandemic the, the, the way Trump did. So I see your point. However, I can tell you that I sit through these daily briefings every single day, and the questions are just as pointed as they were during the Trump administration when the level of offense, as it were, is nowhere near what was going on at the time. I mean, Trump told people to inject disinfectants, right? So let's not forget that that happened. That was a thing. Uh, I'm just cracking up here, SV. It's really bizarre world looking back at some of the stuff that the last guy did. When you say it, it's unbelievable. So we're going to go next to Eric. Traditional media tends to cover the Trump voter, irrespective of the 81.2 million Biden voters or the 2.888 million third party voters. Do you think that that is a disservice to the voters that (laughs) didn't vote for Trump, that we don't get brought up into the conversation with with respect to our perspective on the division and the overall discourse? And to add to that, how can there be unity considering the other guy basically says we're not legitimate if we didn't vote for him? Thank you. Yeah, that that is an excellent, excellent point. I mean, I uh, it, it always always amused me that even after Trump had won, was actually the president, we were still running out and talking to Trump voters like, what are you thinking? What have we done wrong? Why did you do this? And, and yet now that Biden is one, you don't run around going to like Tesla charging stations, talking to people you know, like filling up their their electric vehicles with with uh, with electrons right now. There were seven million more people who voted for Joe Biden. And uh, we don't seem to pander to them as much as we do to the the people who are going to Trump rallies. Um, I stopped. You know, I stopped doing those types of stories because I, I realized, for one, that you often had the same exact people, not the same types of people, the same exact people going from one Trump rally to another. I mean, it was like a Grateful Dead thing. You know, they, they just go around. This is the, the, the North American tour for this year. And you don't really learn that much from talking to them again and again when they're treating it as entertainment and, and you know, hitting all the, the major concert stops. Yeah. It, it, there is... And maybe this is part of of what we used to think journalism was, right? It was about um, the white factory worker in Youngstown not having a job anymore. Uh, how do how is his displacement going to affect this country going forward? And in a way, we're still writing that story, you know, thirty years later. Thus concludes today's installment of Politics and Media 101. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to SV Date and the Huffington Post. Again, this was an edited version of a much longer conversation that was taped live, just like all of our episodes. If you want to join us, ask an upcoming guest a question, or hear past episodes, please visit our website, pm101.live. Our next episode on Monday will feature Barbara McQuaid, who's a former prosecutor. She has studied and participated in the judicial system for decades. She has a very unique perspective on this moment in history. Please take a second and subscribe on whichever streaming service you're using right now to make sure you don't miss it. This has been Politics Media 101, produced in partnership with Clubhouse. On behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team, thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon.